Aloha, Dave Lawrence, and uh, member-supported Hawaii Public Radio. It's all things considered. We are really lucky we're backstage here at Blaze Shell Arena, and uh, you can even hear some of the uh, warming up, I guess. That's the kind of festivities that are going on when a band like Chicago are getting ready to play. And uh, we had Lee Lochnane, original member of the band, one of the founders of Chicago, uh, trumpet player. Uh, it was a real thrill to talk to him, not only because the band have a long legacy here in the islands, uh, uh, but he was also sharing some of the techniques for how the records were done, the horn sound. It was really like, uh, I found it very educational. So as I welcome you, I also say thank you for that great phone interview. Well, thank you very much. I'm remembering back to uh, to what I said a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you were talking about the buzz when you were recording the three, and then the, you did the, when you went to double it, you did the three horns the second time. It created this little buzz that was only detectable when you listened closely. Right. And that's, that's when we were, we were, when we doubled, we played exactly the same notes on on both sides and it was so close intonation wise that that created the buzz then subsequently we went to uh, filling out the chord more by playing different notes we would invert the chord on the on the double and that changed the sound again and then and then beyond that we started putting uh, especially for the ballads we would make it even warmer with a, a, a left and right and then a center so it got really full and you explained, you just touched on it again, the other part of the magic, which was part of the, the interview we did the other day, was you were explaining how you pick the right node, the right chord uh, for each horn, and that helps to give it the fatter sound. Because my question had been, is it really just three horns because it sounds so fat? And you were, you were outlining two techniques, one the doubling, but also picking the right note to hit it, I guess. Right. Well, when you play live, if you overdub, especially three times, you have to, in, in order to make it sound the same or very similar live you have to pick exactly the right notes for that chord to sound something like it did on the record so that's a, a whole different technique right yeah so i get it it involves there's two things there there's one just making it sound good for your record but then you have to reproduce it live and there's some level of thought into, into being able to accomplish that you don't want to set the bar so high i kind of when i hear some of my favorite rock bands from when the singers were real young, the way they were singing, I, I feel for them today trying to reproduce some of that stuff. Yeah, they have to reach down and grab something <laughs> <Right>. to, <laughs> to pull that off. Lee, we never talked about it, but the, like your love of music, you've been able to, a lot of the time recently, artists I've been discovering, they started with this passion at a really young age, but it was also discovered by people, nurtured by people at a young age. When we think about your playing, take me to when music entered your life. Oh my God, well, it entered my life when, when I was uh, just figuring out what the English language was, you know, I mean, that's when music comes in. And uh, my dad was a trumpet player when he was young, and uh, he had, act I never heard him play because he had stopped after he got out of the service, he never touched his horn again. And, uh, uh, but he had all of the big band records from the 40s, 30s, and 40s, and I used to listen to those all the time, and that's what got me started. When I, when I started playing trumpet, I started playing along with those records, Glenn Gray and uh, Artie Shaw and Glenn Miller and Tom, Tom, uh, Tommy Dorsey, Tommy and Jimmy. Yeah, so that was my beginnings. How old were you? 11, when I started playing the trumpet. And at what point did you realize that this was, that you wanted to pursue it as a full-time gig? I mean, I'm imagining at some some point as a teenager, maybe it wasn't a really catalytic moment, but when you look back at it, how do you remember it? It was only a couple of years that I decided that I wanted to do it for a living, for a profession. And when I did that, ironically, my dad tried to talk me out of it because it would be so difficult for me to make it. You know, how, how many people realistically can make it in show business and uh, I just never looked back and that's I guess why asking someone like yourself I mean to have a career like this and this band it's uh, when you're playing in a big arena people could say wow they're, they're still doing it and, you, and um, I guess it was Randy Bachman told me you know people forget about all the hard times in between you know but but it, you, you, you know what you've built is built on a lot of ups and downs and, and ins and out one thing I read I don't know if it's true but I'm hoping uh, in honor of maybe just his memory and, and your place in the band I had read that it was Terry who sort of brought you to some of these other cats in the very beginning if you can talk about how you guys all met each other when you the very first group of you just saying hi getting to know each other right. and and how those relationships develop well terry walter and danny played in a group called the missing links 
and I used to go sit in with that band. When that band broke up, and we had, I was a freshman in college then at DePaul University, and Walt was going to school there. Uh, Jimmy moved in from um, uh, Quincy College in uh, uh, southern Illinois, or a little little south of Chicago, and, and then came up and went to DePaul University. When when the Missing Links broke up, Walt wanted to form another band, and the initial impetus was to go to Vegas, be a, a Vegas show band, and. Uh, it started right there. You know? So, so the first guy that you met who would end up being a bandmate. I'm just like looking at like the link. When you look back, can you still remember when you first met one? I mean, because you, I'm sure when you first met him, you had no idea what was about to happen. You know what? I'm I'm trying to remember what the first meeting was, and it's uh, it's not coming to me right now. But all of a sudden, we knew each other. Walt and me and Terry and Terry and I clicked. You know, we were always together, and uh, in fact, when we first started going on the road, uh, each of us had to share a room with somebody else, and that was when we were staying at Holiday Inns, where you had to go outside to go to somebody else's room. You know, so no matter what the temperature was, there was no in- interior hallways. <laughs> and and when we first got together, it was even more than that. There was a party room and a sleep room. That's all we could afford at the time. Yesterday, maybe you know this, anniversary of the passing of Terry. Um, and one of the ways that, uh, as we segue into to this project, this uh, uh, documentary, uh, as I wrap it up with you, um, and I'm hoping there's going to be some, some level of insight in there for him. And kind of like when I was talking about the Rock Hall, I think it's like a path forward for people in the future to learn about you equally. This cat who left so long ago, but was part of the band, had a really important role in the sound, and you just kind of talked a little bit. If you can riff on where you see some of the important parts of what he did for the band, if you can just kind of like, you know, looking back and also as you look forward to how this documentary may portray some of that. Well, the remaining four members that were with the band when Terry was with us, remember that he was sort of the leader. He would he would start off with a sort of a uh, and getting the, the rhythm together. And then he would, once he got that tempo in his head, then he would count off the song and then we'd start. And at various times during uh, solo portions of, of the song, he would sort of construct how the solo was going. He would be listening to the soloist and see, you know, when it reached its peak and then sort of get to the end, and then he'd give a whistle, his high-pitched whistle that would go over the top of the band. It was uncanny how he could do that. And then we'd have like four bars and come in with the next part of the song, go back to the bridge or whatever. And uh, the documentary is from our beginnings right up to, I think, like the 47th year. And then, we, you know, we mentioned that we haven't been in the Hall of Fame, and now we're going to be able to put a little addendum at the end saying, well, they're in the Hall of Fame now. <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Who knew? So, but, but by the time we ended filming the, uh, the documentary, we weren't, and now we are. So we're going to be able to mention both things, how long it took, and then the fact that we're in it, and what an honor it is to be there. But Terry gets mentioned quite a bit, in the, especially in the early years, and you know, it's uh, hopefully everyone will like it. It's going to premiere at the uh, Sedona International Film Festival on February twentieth. Yeah, because when we had talked on the phone and wrapped it up, it left me thinking, because what your words, I'm just paraphrasing, we were talking about the Rock Hall, and you were like, well, Terry's the only one who for sure won't be there. There are these other cats who may not be there. They probably are going to be because of the level of what it is, but it just... It hit me and I was like, wow, you really, um, you know, so someone going to, so I guess you do feel in some ways you'll be representing his spirit, speaking, uh, you know, thinking about him that night. I'm sure you'll get a feeling when you go in the door. Oh, yeah. His feeling, his, his spirit will definitely be there with it as with us as it is now, tonight, when we go out and play. Do you do you feel, have you since then, are there, are there times that you just, you have like a very strong feeling that he's with you during a show or at moments in your life? Uh, yeah. So, you know, sometimes, usually during the course of a show, you're too busy figuring right. out what to do next, you know? Right. Yeah. So I meant it's a passing thing. It's the kind of thing that like exactly. when you have the moment to, because you're a very busy man, I watch you and I'm going to be tonight. But, but yeah, I just was curious about that. As you said. So yeah, you do, you do get that feeling at times because it's like all these years you've kept this flame going and there was this guy, you shared rooms, you, you watched him count it off, you watched right. him formulate. And then, uh, and it just made me feel like, I guess there's a bit 
bit of tribute that is embodied in, in what you're doing today. Yeah. And, you know, when when he left and uh, moved to the other side where we can't see him anymore, uh, we had no idea how deep the bench was pretty, pretty much with, with our group. And uh, we have found out subsequently that we can uh, we can make it. Lee Lochnane, and uh, original member of Chicago, founder in the band, and just so grateful that you would take some time to sh- reflect with us on the history of the group and uh, share these great stories. I hope you, you feel appreciated. I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You are welcome.